Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I think hopefully this is working. I'm awaiting. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, latest Find My Past live broadcast. I hope you're all there at home, nice and safe, staying indoors and uh, keeping happy, perhaps doing some family history. Uh, I'm Miko Cleland. Uh, I'm a Find My Past resident genealogist, and I'm here to answer some of your burning questions as we all sit and stay safe uh, away from everything. And um, we've got so many questions to go through. Please ask more questions, say hello, everything that you can do. Uh, I can see comments as they come through. And there's the lovely Ellie as well, uh, curating and helping and managing things at the same time. So uh, hi there, Anya. Nice to see you. Um, let's have a look at some of the things that we've got to talk about. Also, I wanted to share something that I've found really useful during this uh, difficult time. Uh, it's been a way of getting out of the house without actually leaving, uh, which is something all very exciting. So um, it's actually Google Earth, which I mentioned last time we spoke a little bit. There's a, uh, a link that you can get to, which I'm sure we'll post. Um, you can look at it in your browser and you can see the whole world. You can go zoom in, see everything in 3D from above, uh, but you can also go down into streets and you can walk the streets using Street Viewer. And I've been using this for family history as well. So I've been using this to look at the street names and the places that are mentioned in old censuses and old records so that I can see where my ancestors lived without having to go there. And at the moment, with the inability to travel, it seems like a really good way of seeing more of the world. And I've got a little bit of a challenge for you, I think. Um, I'm going to head over to the Find My Past forum after this and maybe share some of my own. But um, why not use Google Earth to take a look for your ancestors' houses and places that are relevant to your family history? Go in and browse and take a look and move around the world and find them and share pictures of what you found. Uh, don't share, of course, anywhere that you live now, uh, but uh, anywhere that is from your family story, definitely do that. And um, if you have anywhere else you want to visit as well, it's a really good way of uh, getting your morning exercise without having to uh, travel too far. So that's my my little tip. And I'm seeing some questions coming through. Um, hi, Charlotte, you found ancestors in Gibraltar. How can you research this further? Uh, the Gibraltarian archives have a lot of records uh, that they've started to index and publish online themselves. We have a few. Um, we have a lot from the St. Andrew's Church in Gibraltar, uh, which um, is the uh, Church of Scotland uh, established church there. Uh, but there are other records as well. Uh, take a look at those records on our site and then also take a look at the Gibraltarian archives website. And as I said, a lot of that stuff is in index form and possibly digitized as well. So you can find, it does depend how far back you're looking, but there are lots of records for you to look at as well. Uh, I see Anya saying, where would be the best place to look for Italian records? Well, um, the best place for Italian records, first of all, is the Ministry of Culture in Italy, as they're embarking on a huge project to digitize all of their civil registers. Civil registers in Italy start basically whenever Napoleon arrived. So in the north, a little bit earlier than the south, because Napoleon never got there in the south. In the south, they start in 1820. So it's 1820 or before, and you have these civil registers. Uh, when you look at those, um, they give you lots of details about your ancestors. They tell you everything about not just uh, someone's parents, but the parents' parents in all of these birth records. So they're really exciting to find. Although, um, you may be a little daunted when you see that they're in Italian. They're very formulaic and very easy to read. If you know in which piece uh, that you're looking for, it's in a particular spot in the transcription. So you know that there is where the mother's name is. That's where everything else is and the occupation, etc. So uh, they're quite easy to get your head around once you're there. Um, but start with the Ministry of Culture. There are a few collections elsewhere. Uh, we have a handful. There are other places online as well. But um, the Ministry of Culture put them all online for free. Um, you will need to look at indexes and move backwards and forwards. They're not searchable by name, but it's not 
too difficult uh, once you get the hang of it. So definitely that's the place to go. Um, I know that we have some more as well. Um, hi there, William. That's how uh, he found the family house in Hong Kong using uh, Google Earth. That's really interesting. That's great. Well, definitely if if uh, no one that's related to you still lives there, we'd love to see a picture of that as well. So maybe we'll start a thread on the forum just after this, and I'm sure I can share some Sicilian uh old buildings as well, although they're probably not nearly as grand as anything else. Hi, Cindy from Aberdeenshire. Uh, we've got a really good record set from Aberdeenshire coming in about a week's time. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It's going to be a really nice one, really big. Um, Anya as well uses Google Earth for snooping on where their family lived. Yes. See, an interesting thing you say that um, a lot of these places are gone and um, Google Earth have been doing a very really clever thing, or Google have with their street view. When, when they go back, uh, they're keeping the old photographs they've taken. So in some places where they've been more than once, you can move through time and you can see what it looked like maybe 10 years ago when they were there the first time. It's not so useful now, but if you can imagine in a hundred years time, how clever that would be, that would be a really good tool to use. So that's quite exciting. Uh, so let's take a look. Um, hi, Helen. Yes, staying fine, staying safe. I hope everyone else is as well. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, everyone else. Um, so um, Julie uh, McKnight, my husband has ancestors in Ceylon. Uh, when we're looking at Ceylon, um, it was covered by the India office, I believe. So although not India, uh, the India office covered other territories as well. So uh, those records are included. Uh, there's a massive collection of records that we have exclusively on Farm My Past from the British Library to records from the India office of baptismal registers, marriages, burials, and a few other things. So start with those. And there's also a society called FIBIS, the Families in British India Society. They're basically the experts when it comes to uh, getting uh, down and into the details for things like this. So they're also worth taking a look at as well. Uh, and they might have some records for you. Um, it's worth mentioning as well that the records that are in the British Library are the records that made it back. So not all of them did. They were put on boats and sent there, and sometimes they didn't quite get there. So there's a large amount, but of course, they're not comprehensive because of that. As good as we can get, but we've always got to have some thing in mind when we know and just be aware of it. Um, so we see Lindsay, you have a brick wall in the Italian branch of your husband's. It seems so many people with Italian ancestors. I'm in good company today. That's great. Uh, Centani uh, in Bocca del Lupo. Uh, but... Um, uh, let's uh, think about that. Um, perhaps maybe we could do something specific for Italian research in the future. I'd be excited, but I, I think we have to make sure there's enough of us all together at one time. I said Italian research is really simple once you know the building blocks, um, and those building blocks um, are very easy to teach. So I'd be really excited to do that. So that's something really good that maybe um, Ellie is probably eagerly listening and, and hopefully will do something Italian in the future. And maybe it's an excuse to get my flag out and start cooking. Um, uh, hi, Sharon from Australia and uh, everyone else saying hello. That's great. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to some of the questions that were posted a little bit earlier as well, because um, let's try and make sure everyone gets a, a fair go at things uh if i can find them as well um let me just see if i can get hold of them i know everything's moving around uh right okay so um apologies for this i'm going to keep talking and going through as we go uh everyone's still saying hello it's lovely to see everyone chatting together and uh doing things all as a group um that's one of the best things that i've noticed about us all being uh, cooped up is that we're all uh, learning together and sharing things in a way that um, I don't think I saw beforehand. And I hope at the end of this, it continues. I hope that so many other people um, carry on doing this and, and I definitely will be getting more involved as much as possible uh, with people because um, it's wonderfully heartwarming. It's great to see. So um, here we have, uh, let's take a look at some of the questions that were asked before. Um, we have here, do, 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 apologies for the thing. So, um, someone is looking for uh, a brick wall trying to find out what happened to their great great grandfather, William Thomas Ponter, born around 1834. He married my grandmother, Frances Morris, on the 11th of July 1856, and they went on to have three children. One of these is my great grandfather, who was born in 1862. My great-grandmother married a William Gray in 1868, but I can't find any record of my great-great-grandfather's death or divorce. Can you help? 
So it would depend slightly on uh, their status, a societal status as to whether they would get a divorce. At this point, it was still very, very hard to get a divorce, very, very expensive. So if your ancestor was uh, quite well off, it's possible that may have happened, but there are very comprehensive indexes uh, to show you whether that's taken place. I think we have that index on Find My Past as well. But uh, more likely, uh, the people would move elsewhere and do things and uh, marry someone else. Bigamy was a thing that happened a lot more than it, it does today because we can't check up on a computer uh, to make sure someone's not married and be certain. But I would I thought the more likely case would be that this person has died uh, and we're before uh, the sort of 1870s. So uh, the obligation for reporting all this stuff is on the registrar's shoulders rather than the people involved, those present. So that means that we have a few didn't quite get through. So although although we say that this is comprehensive, um, it's not uh, hugely, you know, it's not 100% comprehensive. There are some slight gaps and maybe they slip through, but there are other places to look. So take a look at burials. Take a look at this point because this is after the 1850s, start of the 1850s, church burials, these churchyards were so full that they needed another way to uh, fit people in some of these places were just they couldn't have anyone else inside so they opened these council burial sites these parochial burial grounds uh, were on one side and then you know there'd be uh, council burying grounds as well and this happened all over the country so it means that they are um, non-denominational uh, you don't have to be a member of a particular church to be there they're run by the local government and uh, they came into effect and those burial registers aren't parish records so uh, a lot of them are online some of them aren't some indexes are free to view and different council websites sometimes councils will ask you for a name and they'll go and look for it themselves so look for the local council burial site as well uh, as as the parish that you can look for um, and uh, take a look for that um, also, at this point as well, um, don't just look at parish records. Definitely look for your county. Look at uh, nonconformist registers as well. This was the golden age of nonconformism. If your ancestors can't be found in baptisms, marriages, or burials in the mid 1800s, this was a point when the the gloves came off when it came to um, the, the faith. And there were many different religions that uh, established a foothold, particularly in certain parts of the country. And you can learn more depending where the, your ancestor was from. And so your ancestor may be buried very near to where you'd expect, but perhaps they were Methodist or perhaps they were Congregationalist or uh, Moravian or anything else that you can think of. These uh, places often had their own burial grounds and, and that might be where to look as well. So these are a few other places to see. I mean, if they had property as well after 1858, those are centralized by the government. And there's a really nice searchable index we launched about a month ago, our uh, government probate death index. Take a look at that as well. Although the later you get, there's more chance of property being inherited and, and more people having property and more complex arrangements as well. Because if you give all your property to your next of kin, your wife, something like that, then that wouldn't need probate, so that wouldn't be included. But uh, a really great resource as well. So there are a few places to look if you can't find that death. Hopefully one of those will have some more detail for you and that will help too. Um, hi, Sean. Uh, we're best place to look for British ancestors who lived and worked in Spain between the 1850s and 1930. The first place to look, I would imagine, would be the Spanish archives. Um, you'd have to look at individual regional ones as well as perhaps a national one. I'm not too familiar with them, but I found um, particularly uh, when it comes to doing research abroad, that there are um, wonderful archivists working there that get quite excited that someone from far away is interested in these these records. So uh, they can be really helpful. So send them an email. Uh, they obviously understandably probably won't be replying too quickly right now uh, if they're working at all. But uh, get that email in so that when they do come back, they're ready. Uh, I've been really helped by uh, an archive in Portugal that I got in touch with who um, I found my uncle's name in one of their records and it was quite confusing. I didn't really understand why. I had a look and there was a visa granted uh, for him to visit Mozambique in the 1970s. So uh, that was a complete surprise. Uh, I asked uh, for this record and said, this is my uncle's record. Uh, how 
can I get it? Is there any money I need to pay? Anything like that? And they just scanned and sent the whole thing straight away. So it was a wonderful thing. They're all really, really helpful. So definitely never forget an archivist. They're very, very useful as well. Um, I'm trying to read everything coming in at once. So let's see what we've got as well. Um, catching up on some comments too. Um, what have we got? Um, Ali has an Italian connection as well. That's quite exciting. Uh, so we're all in very, very good company. <clears throat> Um, Diane, you're wondering why you can't find a marriage certificate for grandparents when you can find the children's birth certificates tried overseas marriages as well to no avail. Um, I'm guessing at this point, because we, we don't uh, have the year, um, it would depend slightly. Um, I'm assuming it's in the middle of civil registration and we're looking fairly modern. Uh, there are bands to look for as well. Um, bands uh, are uh, much rarer to find because they're usually, uh, you know, not as important as marriages, so they're not kept so well. Um, and also marriage licenses as well are interesting. Um, when they exist, they're great, although there's a small amount of those. Um, if you're um, looking for marriages outside of civil registration, try uh, churches. There are very different records in our parish registers. If after 1812, um, the marriage register is an exact copy of the uh, civil reg register for 1837. Um, and that means that you've saved yourself about £9.25. And nowadays, at the moment, when we can't get these registers, uh, it's a great place to look. The um, uh, I'm, I'm going back and thinking if we go through the different times, um, when we're looking at these marriages, we've said we've got that, we've got grandparents, we've got the children. Uh, look at where the children are born and try and zero in on that parish and try and look for that parish and see what's there. And when we're looking at uh, civil registration, uh, try and look for the district, try and work out which district that parish is in. But remember as well that there wasn't a huge obligation to be married in the parish that you're from, uh, especially if people were from multiple parishes. Um, traditionally, it was in the, the wife's parish that people would be married in, but people often married somewhere else if it was cheaper or anything else. Um, and if we're looking at way further back, uh, there are fleet marriages as well, which at one point in the 1700s, uh, one in six marriages in the country were taking place in fleet. And this is a place for a quick, uh, easy, cheap marriage, uh, which uh, doesn't require all of the uh, things that had to be gone through, these different hoops had to be jumped in other parts of the country. It was uh, just outside Fleet Prison in London. So particularly if your ancestors were from the south or from London, it's one place to look as well. Um, if we know what year we're looking, it might be a little easier. So maybe uh, we'll take we'll come back to that one if there's some more. Um, hi, Cheryl. Lots of Italian descendants in North Yorkshire due to Middlesbrough, uh, Boomtown. Um, let's take a look. Yes, a lot of Italian restaurants. Always interesting hearing the owners telling stories of their ancestors, how they arrived in the air with nothing and settled to marry and raise their families. So um, I know this is turning into quite an Italian-centric uh, presentation, so I, I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, turn back to Britain as well. But this is quite interesting in that there are three waves of Italian migration. There's the first wave, uh, which came very, very early on. The second wave, um, which came a little bit later, the first wave was sort of the early to mid 1800s from sort of 1840 onwards. And they were people primarily from two different places, from uh, Parma and uh, Lucca and places around there in the north. And they were quite skilled laborers and craftsmen. They made plaster work, those stucco plaster figurines and things like that you can see uh, that were quite popular in the Victorian era. You'd want this bust of a famous person that you could have in your house. And these Italian workmen and craft people would do that. Uh, and also people who made things like barometers and uh, various different kinds of delicate things. Then there's the second wave, which kind of coincided with the finishing of a railway in Italy where people from the south then suddenly uh, left in great numbers. Also, Italian unification meant that uh, the south was incredibly poor and became much poorer from that point onwards from sort of 1861. And there was a, a huge uh, wave of these people leaving um, and that continues. Uh, and then we have um, a third wave, which is the 1950s. And that was people uh, leaving those people that perhaps we, we know, and many are still alive, who came and uh, settled in and uh, in places like Middlesbrough. I think there's some 
communities in Norfolk and other places I know a lot came uh, to Scotland and sold ice cream and made fish and chip shops and all kinds of things. Uh, wonderful additions to our culture and uh, our heritage and uh, very, very exciting. Uh, so yes, I'm going to look at some others uh, so we don't get uh, too fixated on my favourite topics of uh, going to Italian research because I don't want to uh, uh, bore you all with that. Uh, let's take a look at some more uh, questions. Uh, I could talk all day about Italy, so just be careful. Um, uh, Lisa Cutler-Moore, what else could I look at to find my grandmother's death? I've asked on very helpful forums, but no joy. I think she died in 1974, Wolverhampton. Sarah Snaith Nay Hill was known by as Sally by many. I searched all name combinations along with misspelling and also searched Smith just in case, which is a good idea. I know where her ashes were buried, so I'll take a trip to the Midlands as soon as we're able, but I'd love to have info for my tree. If her ashes were buried, and you know where that is, try and find that burial register. As I said, it won't be a parish register, most likely, at this point. Uh, it will probably be a, a council burial ground, but they often have date of death in as well as date of burial, and, and so that might be helpful indeed. They'll often have last residence and place of death as well, depending on where you're looking. So that will be the place to go. And I think that might give you the answer that you're looking for. Um, let's see. Um, so many people saying so many things at once. Uh, there's lots of things. So um, here we take a look at what everyone's saying. It's great that everyone's uh, commenting again and talking. Uh, we've got a brick wall for George Henry Groves, born in Jamaica, 1864 or 1874, uh, 1901 in the 1911 census. His father is a planter on the marriage certificate in 1901. Uh, George Henry was a seaman. He married in Cardiff and had nothing before that. So, uh, Maria, uh, good question. Uh, perhaps start with records of Merchant Navy uh, that we have online. Uh, some of them even have photographs if they serve long enough into the, the more modern era. Um, they are written in a sort of code. And when you find that, go to the individual search page on the record A to Z and then uh, look for a little thing on the right-hand side, which will give you a code unlocker sort of thing, a key that will tell you exactly which port all these pe people were coming from, all these different ships, everything else. Um, it's really useful. Uh, start with those Merchant Navy records. Look for the genuine Navy records as well. We have Navy service records too. But start with the Merchant Navy. It was much larger. Uh, many more people served in there, and they served for shorter periods of time. Uh, it seems that, yes, your uh, ancestors are spread in a number of ways. If his father was a planter, we're looking at um, quite late 1901. Uh, there were plantations there uh, in uh, Jamaica, and still are. Um, at this point, we can't look... Uh, for records relating to um, slavery compensation, which uh, there's a huge database online that's uh, a little bit earlier than that, in the early 1800s, uh, that that is useful for. But if you have any connection there, any uh, aristocratic ancestors who may have had property in uh, the Caribbean, that's one place to find their names and details. Um, I think uh, another place to look as well would be the uh, Jamaican parish registers and Jamaican records that we have as well. Uh, we've just released a huge extra collection of those, uh, I think another million or so. Uh, so look at those as well. Uh, don't be afraid to look at records from other countries. Uh, they can really help you too, uh, despite uh, perhaps only being used to local records. A lot of the things that you learn sometimes will help you as you go through, but do uh, be aware that there are a few little differences and those differences um, sometimes you may need to uh, Google a particular kind of record to get your head around it. Or the best place, and the thing that I always do when I want to learn a new record set, I go to the record A to Z, and I go to that individual record page. And on there, there's usually a description of what the records are, what they can tell you, anything that you need to know about the record set. So you can be a little bit like an expert without having to uh, be prior trained or anything like that. And it does give you a good grounding, tells you anything that may be missing or anything along those lines. So it means that you can be a little more confident when using these records. Um, everyone asking lots of questions. Uh, hi, Emma. Yes, um, Italian ancestry isn't boring. I just, uh, I, I like to mix things up a little bit. And uh, I think if we, we talk too much about Italians, I think everyone who isn't Italian might be a little bit uh, disappointed. So I'm trying to 
chat with as many people as possible. Um, and uh, if anyone wants a, a five hour long conversation about Italian ancestors, I'm sure we'll arrange that separately, maybe on the forum or arrange a Google Hangout or anything like that. Um, so my grandfather, John Donahue, who never married my grandmother, Harriet, so I have no birth details. On 1901 census, it says he's born in Limerick. On the 1911, it says born in Playhouse, Luke Square, hoping the 1921 census will give more details. So, Sheila, uh, that's uh, one thing. Uh, very good question. Um, if they never married, uh, I'm guessing they have different surnames, so that makes it a little bit easier to find them on censuses because Donahue's a little more common name. Uh, when you're searching using a census, you can also search for someone else in the household. So when you're looking at a common name like John Smith, use, perhaps if you know they're married to Eleanor, use that to narrow things down a little bit more. So it seems you've got a really good grounding for that. Um, uh, people sometimes uh, gave different information on censuses. Uh, the enumerator would give a form to the head of the household and ask them to fill things in. And if they couldn't fill it in, then they would do it for them on their behalf. But it depends on what this person tells the enumerator or what they write down. So they may have decided to change things. Or we all have one of those ancestors that seems to get maybe only five years older every 10 year census or something like that just to kind of massage their age and uh, or perhaps if you have an ancestor who married someone who's particularly old or particularly young maybe they moved their uh, ages together a little bit so it seemed a little bit less uh, strange or shocking or um, worth commenting on uh, so uh, that's a big limiter in that we've got you know what people have said but uh, if we're looking at 1901 census 1911 uh, there are incoming passenger lists to the UK, um, and uh, after 1922, um, that covers uh, Ireland as well. We've got different things, but people would also have travelled other ways, so that perhaps is not there. But look for records, perhaps later, perhaps earlier, that can fill in this gap. So, so that might be a little bit later, but perhaps they've gone home to the family, depending uh, what year we're looking at. Um, and uh, why Limerick? So, of course, definitely look in Limerick. That's one thing. Civil registration at this point in Ireland was uh, was prevalent, so that can be a useful place. Look for his name. Look for see who's there. Uh, look for naming patterns. Look for the names of the children. See perhaps if some names uh, reoccur and perhaps some middle names uh, may be used, and that might help you when we're looking at baptisms and other records as well in Limerick to see if there's someone who may be a plausible case and if you do find someone useful in limerick work forwards and see if that person's still there at the same time they're in the uk and uh, that's another way um and that could help you too and the 1921 census hopefully will give us lots of extra details uh, and that's coming very very soon um it's a shame uh, that we've got so much longer to wait uh because of uh, uh just this hundred year rule and uh Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to solve all these mysteries? But uh, it is coming, and how exciting that's going to be when that gets there. And uh, there's also the 1950 US census coming after that. So uh, we're in a, a very great time for family history if we can uh, hold on a little bit longer. Uh, so everyone is still chatting away. It's wonderful. Um, uh, Paul Hudson saying that his mother passed away in 1979. Surely should be visible on the 1939 register. Records that are open are people who are over 100 years old or people that we've managed to match to a, a death record uh, if they have a name or perhaps a date of birth as well that uh, uh, is the same as someone else. Then because we can't be sure, we, we can't open the record because we don't want to open the record of someone who's alive. If you've got a death certificate or some kind of proof of death, uh, you can get in touch and we can open a record for you. But that will be why someone isn't on there. Uh, but we open around about maybe 100,000 records every month or so, with people who get over the age of 100 or people that we have matched. So do keep looking back and look for new records that have been opened. And if you have that information, then do send it in. If you're a subscriber, it doesn't cost anything. And uh, we can get some records open for you. Um, Chris Lang saying the 1921 census won't solve her brick wall. Uh, they know where their grandmother was. They just need to know where they were in 1919. So if they were uh, a little bit uh, well-to-do or, or married someone well-to-do, um, they would have been able to vote from 1918. Uh, it wasn't until 1928 that all women could vote, but uh, there's a chance they may be on one of those uh, first 
uh, electoral registers. So that's something to be proud of as well. They're one of the first women to exercise their votes. That's one chance. Uh, also, trade and postal directories are really useful and they cover all of the UK. Uh, they're available at this point and very prevalent. Uh, we have the yellow pages today and these sorts of things um, carried on all the way back to the 1700s. I find them really useful as a census substitute. Uh, I use them in between census years and I push forwards and backwards through the census year so I can try and get a year of residence and a, a year where this person suddenly appears. And when I can't find them, I then look for the address. And I see if I can find someone else in that building, that house. And then I know certainly that my ancestor wasn't there. And that can really help me too. Um, we have uh, Zoe saying, your grandfather's record is open 1939 register. He should be closed as he's still alive. Uh, it can happen. It's very, very rare. But if it does, get in touch with us and we'll close it very quickly. And so uh, do send an email to our support team. And they'll do that for you very, very quickly indeed. Uh, and then that shouldn't be anything to worry about. So uh, easily to solve, uh, we have here. Um, Kim uh, saying that they know where their great-grandfather is for the 1921 census. They're just going to be interested in what he's calling himself. Oh, all these mysteries, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, I think I'm going to block out all of 2022 and spend the whole year working on that. It's uh, quite exciting. Um, uh, Diane, uh, is there a postal directory for Lewis in Sussex during the 1914-18 war? Uh, there are huge collections of postal directories. Uh, we have a massive collection. If you look in Britain, directories and almanacs is where we keep most of ours. There's a massive collection for Scotland as well. Uh, and uh, do be prepared to browse the old-fashioned way, select a directory and move backwards and forwards. They're often in two sections. You have uh, the first section, or the other way around, depending on who publishes it. One section is by name. So you can search by surname and another one is by street. And so you can go whichever way. So be prepared to just browse through the pages, get to your ancestor's page. You'll get to the page with your ancestor's surname and see what you've got there. And it'll probably give you occupation and address, etc. And if it's an occupation and address that you recognize, then maybe you've found the right person. Uh, you can also search using our OCR index. But, of course, it's OCR, Optical Character Recognition. It's not perfect. It's very good, and it's a great way to start, and I would definitely start with that. But do remember to browse through the pages as well so you can be completely certain that you've definitely given it your best and you're really given through uh, and taken a look for your ancestor. There's so much coming through that it's, it's very hard to keep track, but it's wonderful, again, to see so many people enjoying this. Uh, we're about halfway through. Uh, a wonderful hour, and I'll, I'll pass on to the uh, the Prime Minister, who will probably have other things to talk about. But um, how wonderful that we have some family history uh, to talk about beforehand. Um, Janet Spink, uh, not all were in the early years of registration. Some decades later, when fines for non-registration was introduced, some thought the baptism was enough. That's right. Uh, registration, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, up until the 1870s, the requirement to register in these civil registers that we, we think are 100% complete um, was on this registrar. And the registrar had to go around and look for these records. And um, they did a good job. They did a very good job. But as many sometimes as 15% of records could have been missed uh, because they didn't quite get there and there was no obligation for that to be covered. After that, the fine that when this wasn't included went to the people involved. And so then people were a lot more likely to include this stuff so it gets much better from the 1870s onwards i think about 1872 uh, my own great great grandmother was missed uh, with the civil birth record i've looked and looked i've tried everything i've spent i would say probably about 100 pound on lots of different birth certificates for names that sound slightly similar or names that are vaguely within 100 miles just to see if it's there and all of them are completely different people and they just haven't been captured and um, it's one of those things that happens but uh, definitely um, use baptismal records and things like that uh, when we can't use civil registers and just be aware of that problem with civil registers when we look at things as well that there are other places and again we mentioned non-conformists don't be afraid to look at non-conformist registers as well we have a huge collection catholic registers as well uh, they're becoming more and more available online they're great as well um they're also non-conformist but they're usually stored separately and the same with jewish registers as well so uh, all of those as well if you know a little bit more about where your ancestors come from uh sylvia anti-vaxxers avoided registering their children to hide them from the vaccination officer ah so you see this anti-vaccination 
movement, I know we see it in the press and the news of late as well, has run all the way through history. Uh, it's, vaccination has been a, a thing that has saved many of our ancestors from uh, some terrible diseases, but there are also some uh, people who um, have been against that and have been doing that for, for a long time from from birth uh, of the movement itself for vaccination. And uh, Sylvia is the expert when it comes to that. So she's probably, I'm sure, much better at explaining what went on with that. Uh, we have a, a great collection of smallpox inoculations for the centre of Glasgow from 1801 to about 1850. Uh, it's amazing that this was uh, funded by the uh, local sort of medical college, the surgeons, a rural college of surgeons and physicians of Glasgow. And uh, these smallpox inoculations were given, they had to be given twice. So you gave the first one and they had to return for a second inoculation and just to make sure it works and make sure it took as well. And um, if it didn't, then they'd have to go through the process again. And the problem that they had in the early vaccinations was people would come for their first one and then they'd leave and they wouldn't come back and then they wouldn't be immune. So that was a big problem. Uh, after a little bit of time, they had this clever plan where they would charge people a penny. And uh, when you got your second vaccination, you got your penny back. And so that meant that people then had to come back because they wanted that penny. But these records are from the really poorest areas of central Glasgow. And these people, uh, many of them, as they're often vaccinated when they're very young and in their sort of first six months of life, may not have survived to a point when they were baptised. And so these may be the only registers and the only records that we could have of some of these people. And so uh, they're really, really interesting to look at. Uh, civil registration in Scotland starts in 1855. So they're all before that civil registration. So it's a really important place to look if you've got ancestors from central Glasgow and sometimes further afield. Take a look at these smallpox inoculations and see if your ancestor is there included. Uh, there are lots and lots of... Um, uh, different uh, records to use, very niche, interesting records, and um, all of them are really useful. We collect as many of these strange and wonderful and exciting eccentric records to help you, uh, but of course then uh, use our record A to Z to go through and find them and start again on the homepage with just a name and see what comes through as well. Uh, but on the record A to Z, type in a place, type in anything like that, and uh, maybe a record type, and just see what we have as well, because there are lots of things that sometimes appear a little strange on the outside, but once you get into them, you understand exactly. Uh, dog licenses are one of our sort of firm company favourites, and they are great because they're almost a surrogate census of almost all the Irish farmers and anyone else that had a dog, uh, particularly in towns, uh, small uh, ornamental dogs uh, became really popular in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So you'll find pugs and Pomeranians and things like that, as well as working sheepdogs and things. And you'll find the colour, the breed, the size, everything. They're really interesting records for Ireland, particularly when we have to think a bit laterally when we're looking for more Irish records. Um, Diane, if a death certificate says date of death, February, but informant was in May, saying cause the body to be buried, does that mean they lay in their home until May and the informant had to arrange burial? Um it would depend on the circumstances. Without looking, it makes it a little harder. Um, coroner's inquest reports and things like that, I think we mentioned last time I was here, and so they're quite interesting and useful. Usually they're stored at a local archive, and it depends on the time. Sometimes they're still with the coroner's office, and they're still covered by privacy rules. Uh, they're usually taken for the court, and they can be in court records as well. Uh, but um, that would be one place to look. Um, of course, uh, it would depend if there was no inquest, uh, then um, possibly they were found later. Um, it, it would depend on the circumstances. A cause of death also is one of those interesting things that might help you. Um, if someone has been uh, found much later, it's quite harder to find cause of death. So if it says unknown, that might give you a, a tip off as well. Or sometimes they say unknown and supposed or something like that with an assumption. Uh, so take a look at every part of that record and that might help you too. Uh, Steve has a problem with his two times grandfather who died in 1918 in Dumfrieshire. Have found a newspaper report say his decomposed body was found washed upon the Solway Firth. He's been missing after attending a local fair and can't find any death registration. Well, it seems we're getting um, uh, very uh, into uh, all kinds of very specific things. So hopefully all these things can be applied uh, to other parts of your family history as well. 
But um, so that newspaper report is a good start. It will give you dates. Look around those dates. Um, look again, uh, coroner's report may have happened. Um, I'm not too sure uh, if the Scottish system when it comes to inquests is slightly different. Uh, uh, maybe someone else may be a bit more aware. Um, I'm used to the England and Wales one, uh, but um, definitely look for other records, other reports. Um, there should still be a death registration. Um, if it's a Solway Firth, he may have been listed at deaths at sea. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, uh, the GRO has a collection of those and they cover all of Britain. Uh, so take a look for those. Um, and that would be one place to look, I think we'd start with. And then of course, civil registers in Scotland, uh, perhaps he will be included in those as well. Uh, but there are something called a register of corrected entries that is things are added to these records usually, as when I've found details of an inquest or something like that, some extra coroner's report, they're attached to a death register that way. Um, if he was found in the Solway Firth, um, look at the registration district around that area uh, rather than perhaps where he came from as well. Uh, and that might help you find some more information. Hopefully that's useful. Uh, Denise, so the dog license records for all of the UK. Um, the system, as far as I know, was in Ireland. And so we don't have uh, British dog license registers. And if, if we did, I think we'd be very, very quick to want to have them on, on Far My Past. They would be really exciting, wouldn't they? Uh, so there's lots and lots of uh, uh, wonderful details that we can add. Uh, just be careful when you look at uh, names like Lassie and Rover. Uh, in uh, your uh, family trees online, uh, someone may have decided to add their furry friend to the family and uh, that uh, might need to be thought of before you add it yourself. Hi, Anya. Uh, any idea where to look for information on gold mining in Africa? Uh, my two times great grandfather wrote to the newspaper in Wigan in 1901 from Borneo, but he later went to Africa. Not sure where, and I believe he was gold mining while his family remained in the UK. I know um, that uh, if he's in Borneo, uh, I think that would be covered, as we said, by the India office. Um, and so that would be one place to look. We mentioned those records a little bit earlier. Um, if he returned to the UK, uh, he will be mentioned on inward passenger lists. So those are a place to look. Um, if he came back before he went to Africa, outward passenger lists are very good. It started in 1890. It seems to be uh, the right place to look. It would depend where in Africa he is as to what kind of records you could find. Um, South African records I've used a little bit and they can be very, um, the indexes really give you almost all of the information that's in the record for some records, which can be a little frustrating. Uh, but uh, uh, if he's there, look at South African archives as well and, and see if they do have anything else. Um, and uh, it would depend. Try and find out if you saw some detail of him when he was in Borneo. Find out if that same company, same mining operation uh, had uh, mines in Africa as well. He's working for the same establishment. Uh, maybe then you can look for records of employment and things like that that might help you. Um, I would assume perhaps he would be independent or he would move to a different company. Uh, so that might be a little harder, but that's another place to look. Um, so let's see my, uh, hi Rhonda, my three times great grandfather was a tobacco and snuff manufacturer in Tothill street, Westminster. I can find no information on him before he marries my three times great grandmother in 1813 at St. Margaret. He states he's a widow on the marriage registry. Any suggestions for perhaps trade directories might lead you to him. Uh, unfortunately he passed away a few days before the 1841 census and the death certificate had very little information on it. So there are trade directories, um, tobacco and stuff manufacturer, it sounds, you've got his street as well. That's the perfect place to look. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head which years we have for London, uh, but definitely said so that Britain directories and almanac collection will take you there. Uh, and there's also a separate, slightly larger collection of London trade directories that we have, uh, which again in the record A to Z uh, or A to Z if you're in the States and uh, just take a look there as well and um, see if those years cover. I think they may be a little bit later, so start in that Britain directories and almanacs as well. Um, Mother-in-law went to the local post office to get a license, and the ancient lady that ran it asked why she wanted one. Your dog will still bark without it. Very remote rural post office. <laughs> Very good story, Linda. That's fantastic. I think, uh, yes, uh, the uh, dog license system was, was to 
uh, keep track of many different dogs and also to raise a bit more money for the government. Um, the, the Irish were very heavily taxed throughout history and um, that was uh, one thing that we have. And uh, uh, Ali has pointed out as well um, that uh, there are dog tax records on Scotland's places and they're for the 1790s, 1797, 1798. So the system uh, did exist uh, in Britain in some extent, but not uh, all over and not to a modern point as we're hopeful. Uh, so that's fantastic. Oh dear, I see um, Ellie is uh, saying that we'll have an Italian record session if uh, people agree. Uh, so that, that'll be quite fun. Uh, perhaps uh, we'll do it in Italian with subtitles. I wonder if uh, uh, Ellie can type quick enough. Uh, that'll be quite fun. Um, but uh, yes, uh, why not? That'll be quite exciting. Um, any excuse to uh, talk about Italy, I will grab with both hands. Uh, I'm trying to uh, fill in in our last uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, trying to see if there's anything I've missed. If you uh, have a question that I have missed, then do shout up and I'll try and catch because they're moving quite quickly and moving through. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm doing my best, but we'll we'll see uh, how we how we get on. And it's also, uh, it's you forget how... Um, how uh, uh, difficult it is to speak non-stop for an hour as well. It's uh, one thing. So forgive me. I'm just going to have a sip. Of, uh... Uh, Lynn Rosenfeld is looking for Baskerville ancestors who emigrated from Ireland to Canada uh, because of the famine, 1846. Does FMP have access to Castle Otway and County Tipperary tenant records from the late 1700s and early 1800s? National Library of Ireland has manuscripts and maps, but they aren't online. <clears throat> so we have a big set of estate records uh, from Ireland, and a lot of these are really useful when it comes to uh, the famine, because this is when many people were uh, evicted from their land as tenants. What happened was the famine went all the way through Irish society, uh, including the landed classes who couldn't have people paying rent because these people couldn't afford it. Uh, so then they also fell on, like we say, hard times. They're, they're still aristocrats, but they couldn't afford to keep their estates. So they would put their estates up for sale and they would list all of their tenants and all the different details of these tenants. Uh, then a new owner would come in and they may then decide to evict the tenants that they had or anything like that. And so this may be a point when your ancestors left Ireland and we have that tenant rental information uh, that can give you the details of them on an estate before they left. So start with those, the landed estate court rentals that we have. They're on Find My Past, uh, they're listed and um, they can be really useful. Uh, in fact, uh, Barack Obama's Irish ancestor connection was proven with these records because they give you lots of detail sometimes about family relations and connections so they can be really helpful too and uh, i'll comment as well we're going to have a, a session on irish records soon uh, so that's a, a really important uh, thing as well we're going to have someone who knows far more about irish research than i do uh, talking about those and uh, that'll be really interesting i might have to tune in for that as well and chris lang says we should have a scottish record session too uh, they differ so much and they do they differ hugely uh, you have to sort of almost start again from scratch when you're learning um, we've had a couple of sessions and we should definitely have some more so i'm sure we'll be back uh, i know this is my second go at this and uh, it doesn't look like we're uh, going to be let out uh, for a little bit of time so um, definitely I think there's opportunity to do some more uh, looking for records and some talking about Scotland and, and of course other people with Ireland very soon as well. Uh, there are just so many different uh, record collections to talk about and to cover. Uh, I see Emma saying there are fatal accident inquiries in Scotland but there are a few records that survive and she's posted a link. Someone died in the Solway Firth it would be worth checking the English records he could have washed up on the English side of the Firth that's very true. Uh, so that's another thing to look. Um, so the GRO here in England and Wales, that's a good point, uh, as well as those that we mentioned overseas as well. Patricia would like some more Cumberland records, hardly any for West Cumberland, or your wish has been granted. There are some more coming at some point soon. Uh, so watch this space. Uh, I've been working on those uh, relatively recently. So uh, yes, definitely uh, keep your eyes peeled and there'll be something. There's always a little bit of a challenge when it comes to getting records online that every single record is someone's ancestor and so we try and make it as fair and even as possible and try and fill gaps and go through um, but uh, 
we'll get there. Wherever your answers are from, we'll get there. And if you're tuned up to our newsletter and it comes you know, every Friday telling you the new records, and if you look on our blog and see the latest records, uh, then it will come to your turn. Uh, it's uh, always great to look in and see what's new. And uh, definitely we're the only website that adds so much and adds records every week. And we continue just to keep adding and adding. And uh, definitely it makes it all the more exciting when those records come. And uh, of course, when records are added for somewhere that isn't where your answers are from, you'll be really surprised at how sometimes your family ends up going in a different direction and then you end up using those records too. So it's great that they're there when they're needed. So that's quite exciting. And uh, uh, Anya is saying they're looking for Lothian records, mid and east Lothian answers for a large part. Again, some records from Lothian on the way. Um, I won't say too much, but uh, there's uh, quite a large collection of uh, searchable records coming very soon. Um, and that will be quite exciting. Um, they will hopefully really help some people. Uh, and then more records as well from Edinburgh on the way as well, which is also technically a Lothian it's uh, in mid Lothian uh, but that also some great uh, records from Scotland on the way too we've got about five minutes left and I see some people saying uh, uh, thank you and uh, and good night wherever you are in the world because some people are, are staying up quite late uh, some people it's very early I know this is a very global uh, broadcast and uh, Apologies for being a little discombobulated. It's uh, wonderful to chat to you all, but uh, I'm, I'm forgetting how it uh, how it is to talk, being uh, so isolated for so long. So it takes some getting used to again. Um, Fiona's uh, asked where that might they find the coroner's report from 1894. They've tried approaching the current coroner's office, but they said they don't have any records from far back. They looked through the British newspaper archive and nothing for that date. It probably was not sensational to report on. Is there anywhere else you can look? So if you know uh, about the inquest and you know about the coroner, um, start with the quarter sessions. Uh, records would have been possibly there uh, if it's a court sort of uh, thing, an issue. Um, also, uh, the coroner may know what they do with older records. They may have given them to local archive, and that's usually what happens. Uh, so uh, that might be the first port of call. Um, let's definitely take a look. Um, local archive catalogues, although the archive itself may be closed, the catalogues are often still online. And so it's a great way to build up a shopping list of things that you want for when things turn back on. Uh, so that'd be really good as well. So uh, thank you uh, very much. I see everyone saying thank you. Some people are saying uh, hello. Um, and uh, I see Maureen saying that their ancestor, Dimitsi, said to have fought a duel and came to England after that in the mid 1700s a count and comfortable gentleman at the Rose and Crown in Knightsbridge 1759 that sounds fantastic that sounds like quite a story I'm sure there'll be plenty of records covering them and uh, with Italian aristocracy as well um, there are some wonderful records for those too and I, I might share a couple that I have um, I have a wonderful book that has uh, all of the established aristocrats in Italy, and it's got hand-painted uh, coats of arms for all of them. It's wonderful to look at. So uh, I'm hoping we'll get to put that on Find My Past at some point soon, but it's uh, uh, a great resource, and um, maybe I'll take a look in there for you and uh, maybe post a comment later if I can find anything for you. Um, I see where people are, are rounding off. I said we, we are getting to the end. Uh, and Denise, it's a good point um, about doing sessions at different times. Uh, there's the forum at all times uh, to look at, the Find My Pass forum. And that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it's all online and uh, that can be answered and people can come back and comment. Um, it's uh, a little harder to do uh, any of these presentations that everyone in the world can get involved with because we, we just have so many different times going on. But uh, we'll definitely take that on and see if we can do different things at different times too. Uh, on is quite right. There's people in the US and Canada as well and other places. Uh, we'll try and find a balance and try and get there. Um, and uh, yes, there's so many people again saying thank you. Um, thanks very much for having me. And uh, I'm sure uh, if I come back again, um, if I'm allowed, if I haven't uh, damaged too much or uh, caused too much mayhem, then um, I'm sure we'll have some more questions and some more answers and more things to talk about. Um, uh, I, again, I mentioned using Google Earth and things like that to, to go for a walk and look for your ancestors' homes and places and things just to get out of the house. Uh, also, I mentioned last time Duolingo to maybe learn the languages of your ancestors, perhaps uh, maybe not Italian, but Gaelic or Welsh or uh, Irish or anything like that. 
there are lots of things we can do to keep busy. And of course, family history, which uh, doesn't really rest. There's always ancestors there waiting to be discovered. Uh, get there, building the family tree. Uh, perhaps if uh, records aren't the thing you're looking for, have a bit of a, a health check on your tree and, and get involved and start uh, polishing it up and uh, making lists and uh, checks on uh, whether you have uh, correct place names and things like that and anything you can do to polish things or maybe take the time to scan some photographs in the house and add those make everything look nice uh, all of these things can really help and it means again uh, when we do have everything open and we can go back out to cemeteries and archives and libraries uh, then uh, we've uh, got a much better tree to put things into and much more things to do uh, thanks very much for everyone i see more people uh, saying uh, goodbye and um, I think, yes, we should round things up. So uh, uh, thank you for offering such wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for uh, keeping me company in my prison here um, up in uh, uh, Dundee where I've been looking outside. And uh, I think I saw a person about three days ago. So uh, that's been quite wonderful. Outside of that, yes, I've been full into family history just like you. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again very soon. Um, do keep finding great things and storing up your questions for the next expert session. Uh, there'll be other wonderful experts with other areas of expertise. And uh, then, of course, again, that Pharma Pass Forum, any time of the day, go there, have a chat and uh, stay connected to people, keep talking to people, and hopefully I'll see you very soon indeed. And uh, uh, definitely um, I will see you again. Take care.